name is Peter and today I will be showing you an experiment with this electromagnetic rail gun. So I will be showing you how this rail gun works, how to build one, and how to perform an experiment that determines how voltage of the battery pack affects the acceleration of a projectile. First, I'll be showing you a simple demonstration of this rail gun. So I have the battery pack over here connected to two alligator clips that are connected to the screwdrivers which serve as the rails and I have a set of magnets underneath. So here's a metal cylinder that isn't ferromagnetic which means it doesn't stick to the magnets and when I place it on it accelerates towards one end and if I disconnect the power source and if I just place it on, nothing happens. But then if I connect it, it will accelerate. And to show that this isn't slanted, I'm going to reverse the polarity of the battery. And then by reversing the current, that means this projectile will, will accelerate the other way. So like that. So now I'll be explaining how the railgun works. So first of all, when you have a charged particle such as this positively charged particle moving at a velocity V in a magnetic field B, there will be a force acting on it. And this force is perpendicular to the velocity and the magnetic field. And when a wire is carrying current, there is pretty much of just moving electrons inside the wire. And these electrons can also be shown as positively charged particles moving in the opposite direction. And this direction is called conventional current. And it, when it moves in a magnetic field, then there will be a force acting on the entire wire. So here's the apparatus that we have. And here's a comparison to, the, to an actual photograph. So here's the two two screwdrivers acting as the rails and the magnets underneath provide the magnetic field. So when you put a projectile between the rails, this completes the circuit and there will be a current running through the projectile. And when there's a current running through the projectile and it's inside a magnetic field, then there will be a force acting perpendicular to it. And since the projectile isn't secured to the rails, then this force will actually roll it along the, the rails and then it will become a moving projectile. Now I will be explaining how to build one of these rail guns. So first we have the ferromagnetic metal plate. So ferromagnetic, again, it means that it's not magnetic itself, but it will attract other permanent magnets. And I have this ruler, which uh, is optional but will be useful if you are using video analysis to track the acceleration. And here I have a array of neodymium magnets. So these are cylindrical and strong and they all have one pole facing upwards. And now you can use some, some of these larger magnets just to make the field, magnetic field above them more uniform. And once you have the magnets to provide the magnetic field, you have these two, two screwdrivers that serve as the rails of the rail gun. So you can just snap them on like this and you can use a popsicle stick or some piece of wood to make sure the spacing between them is more uniform and so that they don't stick together. And, and then you need a battery pack like this. So here I have 12 volt, uh, 12 volts worth of batteries, but anything above four volts should be able to make the projectile move. And you can attach them on with alligator clips like this. And here is the projectile. So the projectile needs to be conductive electrically, but not magnetic. So it shouldn't attract these. So I have an aluminum cylinder for this. 
So now I'll be explaining the lab that we did. So we were measuring how the voltage across the projectile affected the acceleration of the projectile under a constant magnetic field. So we connected the railgun to a variable power supply, which connects to the wall outlet and you can turn a knob up and down to change the voltage. But you can also change the voltage by using different amounts of batteries. And we connected two multimeters to the power supply, one to measure the current and one to measure the voltage. We set up a phone beside the experiment that would capture the side view of the experiment. And for each trial, we would record the experiment and then do video analysis in a software called Tracker. The Tracker video analysis software is free and other videos online can show you how to perform the video analysis. But using the Tracker analysis tool, we were able to find the acceleration of each trial. So we performed 10 trials each at several different voltages. So we have 4.5 volts here, 5 volts, 5.5 volts, 6 volts, 6.5, and so on until 7.5 volts. And when we do a side-by-side -side comparison, we can see that there is a difference in acceleration. So our hypothesis was an expected line of fit, and we expected our data points to fall onto this line. So to create the, this expected line, we need to derive a formula that relates the voltage across the projectile to the acceleration. And we need to know a few formulas to derive this. So the first one is F equals BIL. So this one shows the force on the current carrying wire. So F is the force, B is the magnetic field, I is the current through the wire, and L is the length of the wire. And the second one is Newton's th second law. So it's F equals MA where F is the force, M is the mass of the object, and acceleration is the, A is the acceleration of the object. And finally, we have Ohm's law, which is I equals V over R, where I is the current, V is the voltage, and R is the resistance. So here we have the final formula that we used to find the expected line of fit. So in this formula, V, the voltage, is the independent variable, and A is the acceleration. So this is finding how the acceleration is expected to change when we change the voltage. And here, the magnetic field B, the length L, the mass M, and the resistance R should all be constant. And for the magnetic field, we used a software called FeeFox that can measure magnetic fields with a magnetometer in your phone. We also used a multimeter to measure the resistance of the wire. We used a scale to measure the weight and a caliper to measure the length of the wire. So now we have the final graph with our results and the expected line. So in the y-axis, we have the acceleration in meters per second squared. And in the x-axis is the voltage in volts. And the orange line is the expected line made with the formula shown before. The blue dots are the actual data points and the error bars are the standard error, which is the standard deviation divided by the number square root of the number of trials. There was definitely some systematic error that caused all the data points to be below the expected line. We assumed that rolling friction was the only systematic error and that if we took into account the rolling friction, then we would get a line that matched the data points a lot better. So there we have the green line. For the orange line to shift down to the green line, there would be a coefficient of friction of 0 0.0044. And this value of friction does make sense. And a similar situation that has a similar coefficient would be a bicycle tire rolling on asphalt road. 
However, even if the expected line were to shift down to the green line, then the not all the error bars would pass through the line, so our hypothesis was not supported. We don't know why the trials within each voltage were so consistent, but as a whole, the acceleration didn't increase linearly with the voltage. But overall, the acceleration does increase as the voltage increases. Thank you.